Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining this session. Uh, let me do a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Vijay Masker. Uh, I lead uh, the engineering team uh, in Veritas, uh, lead the data protection engineering team. And I'm also the site lead uh, in Pune. So uh, today's session is about uh, ransomware threat. I think uh, ransomware does not need really introduction uh, uh, to anybody on this call, uh, very, very familiar. Um, and uh, people are, you know, obviously, a lot of customers are concerned about it. Um, and how do we really approach this threat uh, from a data protection perspective? Uh, we believe data protection definitely holds the key uh, for a ransomware threat. So uh, uh, that's whole the session about, um, I'll, I'll describe approach um, uh, you know that that's being taken, which is uh, going to be very effective uh, against the ransomware threats. Uh, and then um, at the end, we'll have a Q and A. So if you look at um, you know what are the growing uh, challenges that a ransomware threat poses, as you know, particularly in last uh, few years in the pandemic, uh, the acceleration of digitization has been enormous. Uh, any enterprise you can think of uh, is dependent on the data and digitization. So data has really become um, the gold or the oil of the century. And as it becomes a set for any enterprise, uh, obviously there are um, the, the, you know, uh, the bad actors uh, around who want to get hold of that asset and uh, you know, take hold of all the data. And that's really the uh, genesis of um, ransomware. Um, why is it more prevalent now? Obviously, there are some logic about uh, being in pandemic causes fear psychosis and um, the tendency of um, responding to ransom um, threats using the ransom. And uh, but but again, as as we know, eighty percent of the people who have paid the ransom never get their data back. Uh, with increasing ID complexity, um, this is really uh, becoming very challenging. Um, also, you know, ransomware is not something um, is a, a individual task. I think you know there there are teams uh, who are organizing and orchestrating the whole um, uh, ransomware attack on uh, on the enterprise infrastructure. It's usually um, it's a multi-week effort. Right, so it'll, it'll get through um, a window or a door. They'll find it. Um, sometimes compromising even uh, internal employees, and somehow get hold of uh, a machine, a server, uh, or some infrastructure um, like even network switches. And from there, uh, they will proliferate and and take hold of it. So um, it's it's not unusual to call ransom as service. Right, that's exactly what um, the bad actors are. Going after, um, you'll see many uh, customers. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's not question of if; it's question of when. Um, every enterprise uh, will be facing this challenge. Uh, almost seventy percent of the organizations across the globe have kind of publicly accepted that they have been um, attacked by ransomware. Thirty uh, percent probably do not accept it, but <laughs> there has been attack. So it's um, it's going to be every enterprise uh, sooner or later uh, will face this threat. Uh, and some of them have already faced it, they know the consequences. So it's it's very, very important. Now, why does the data protection um, become uh, the savior in this, right? So if you look at a typical enterprise, um, it would have its old perimeter protection, uh, whether it's a data center or cloud, they will have their security measures. So um, plus they will have a lot of awareness within the enterprise to ensure that uh, an employees are careful about uh, you know, phishing attacks and any of other attacks to get into um, the enterprise network. So um, that's the first level of defense, right? Where enterprise tries to put a lot of security measures to ensure that 
um, uh, no bad actors are able to get hold of infrastructure in enterprise. Uh, but you never know, right? There, there are compromises happen uh, and 80% of the time it's internal um, you know, infrastructure, internal employee uh, uh, can get compromised and that leads the penetration or uh, the attack, right? And that's initial penetration leads to um, uh, getting hold of infrastructure and from there, um, the attack kind of starts. So um, if, if you look at the overall, um, uh, the layout of um, the whole infrastructure, um, you know, they will take off, they, they'll take the view of the whole infrastructure and then then design the attack and orchestrate the attack. And, and that's where that's where um, the whole ransomware will attack. So now what, right? If, if, if the attack happens, uh, what are the um, uh, recourses for uh, enterprise? Um, you know, one obviously is to, um, you know, pay the ransom and hope the data comes back. Uh, as I said, 80% of the time, it will not come back. So many of the enterprises are looking at their data protection or the backup strategies to recover the data that is getting compromised through ransomware attacks. And that's where um, a second or a last layer of defense is uh, the backups um, that uh, customers have. So uh, that's where data protection has really become the last layer of defense, right? So first layer of defense, obviously, you'll try to protect your enterprise through uh, the layers of security that you'll design, the, the scanners on the individual clients or servers, uh, the network uh, protection, uh, and and all all the layers in, in between. Uh, but if a penetration happens and gets compromised, then data protection becomes a savior, and that's where the enterprise are looking at data protection as the as the last defense against the ransomware attack. So in subsequent uh, uh, you know slides, I would show you uh, what is the approach recommended approach uh, for um, you know this cyber threat that we have, uh, how to really build the resilience. So uh, a great reference here is uh, this National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, they have recommended uh, approach uh, for this and uh, that's based on really uh, three, uh, uh, three dimensions. Uh, first one, uh, so it's a protect, detect and record. The first protect is essentially about um, really trying to see how do you take care of the backup or the data that you are protecting, make it more immutable. Um, and uh, the data can be segregated at different places. How do you really identify the data, make sure it's completely immutable and the whole solution can perform at a scale, right? Because as the data is growing, you need to really confirm that uh, the protect part is able to handle the scale. The second is a detect, which is um, you know able to figure out if there is an attack, and that's where it's very important. To think of it, right? If if the applications are or the servers are infected, and you take a backup of that application server, a backup image will have uh, malware, and so when you restore it back, um, it's it's meaningless because you have infected backup. So uh, the detect part becomes very important that uh, you are able to um, you know, see if there's a malware attack and take some preventive measures, uh, like securing uh, older backups, not letting it expire, uh, you know, isolating certain infrastructure or isolating certain clients, uh, machines, network, and so on. So uh, detect is absolutely very, very important. And uh, recover is again, is a, La, you know, a very important pillar because in case uh, the data center uh, or the whole enterprise security is compromised and they have to resort to restoring from the backup images, then how do you recover? Now, it may not be one machine. Uh, it could be one file to one machine to multiple machines. That means you'll have to figure out a way to orchestrate the whole recovery mechanism uh, ensure that um, you know you are able to um, you know bring the recovery at scale, uh, and that's very important. So really, a three-prong approach um, is what um, is what recommended by NIST, and I, I, I you know feel that this is very very robust approach. Uh, if you strategize your uh, you know data protection against a ransomware threat. Um, 
So, uh, you know, double clicking on that uh, as part of the strategy, the first pillar, which is very, very important is the protect. Um, you need to really make sure that um, your data is integral, uh, the systems are hardened, they're immutable. Uh, now remember that uh, in case of protect, it, it's not just about the customer data, or the backup images, the backup infrastructure or the backup application itself will be also under threat. So how do you really make sure the backup application itself is protected and it has become resilient and robust because uh, many of the bad actors, uh, as they attack the data center, they also know that the administrators will resort to the backups for recovery. So they would go after the backup application so that the backup application is compromised and through that they can uh, you know, uh, make um, uh, access to the customer data or enterprise data and, and try to temper that data or delete that data. So. Uh, getting an entry into backup application is very, very, uh, you know, kind of an easy route for customers. And that's the reason it's very important to make sure uh, you, when you think of protect is not only protecting the customer backup data, but also about um, the backup application, which is moving the data is resilient for any attack and is hardened. Um, the data obviously has to be immutable. That means the data you do a backup, that backup is going to be there for 15 years, then that data cannot be changed, that image cannot be changed, right? So that's that's what immutability means. So integrity, immutability, hardening, absolutely key um, strategies for uh, protecting um, the environment or protecting the customer's uh, data. The second part is a detect. And um, you know, you'll, you'll wonder why detect is um, uh, you know responsibility for uh, for our data protection uh, the primary is because uh, when you when you're protecting the data uh, that's a very good indicator uh, if you look at the data change rate or number of files the size of the data you have uh, backing up gives a very good indicator if there is an attack underway so you know as as uh, ransomware encrypts the data creates certain extensions of files uh, suddenly there's a change of data change rate. And that's the indication that um, there is a threat underway. And so uh, detect um, is an additional defense that data protection software can provide, uh, which indicates that um, there could be an attack underway. And that detect will anyway uh, also be recommending some actions like isolating a client or making sure uh, the backup images are not um, expired and so on and so forth. So once you have a detect in place, um, there could be a set of actions that detect can help you uh, to make sure the data remains safe. And lastly is the recover. Uh, and that's really about how do you really um, orchestrate um, uh, the recovery either on in the data center or onto the secondary site and bring uh, the application services back online with the, uh, with the previous copy of the data. So. Um, now, recovery has to be orchestrated, it has to be automated, it has to be running at scale because when attack happens, it can take multiple uh, application servers down or in fact, and so it should be, uh, the solution should be uh, designed uh, to take care of a scenario where uh, there are multiple uh, in, you know, applications are infected and you need to recover um, all of them at a, at a, you know, in a short while or short time um, and, and that's that's going to be a re really key uh, part of the strategy. So again, to repeat, uh, you know, for any ransomware attack, uh, data protection or a backup and recovery becomes the last uh, layer of defense. And uh, to be effective in that defense, you need to have really three-pronged strategy. First is protect, protecting the customer's data as well as protecting the infrastructure, which is moving this data backup application itself. Um, detect, uh, it's again, something that can complement in with other software that is existing for detection part, uh, because the data you're handling data, it's a very good uh, indicator to you uh, as a backup application if there is a malware attack underway. And third, uh, which is very important strategy is recover in case um, application uh, is infected, uh, how do you recover? Uh, orchestrated, automated fashion, and at a bulk uh, fashion, so that uh, you can bring the whole data center back up online 
um, in a very short amount of time. So that's a strategy. We'll click a little bit on each of these uh, strategies a little bit more and see what are the different uh, solutions and uh, technologies uh, at play. Uh, so really look at uh, from, um, you know, uh, how do you really go and build the cyber resilience in, in a six uh, steps. Uh, first, uh, illuminate uh, uh, with the data. So essentially, how do you have visibility of data? Do you have um, uh, pockets of the, um, you know, infrastructure which are not visible and that are not backed up? Uh, because uh, that will be a huge surprise, right? When, when the attack happens and you do not have backups, uh, then what would you recover from? So that's very important to have, uh, have a complete visibility of where does the re data reside? And with this IT complexity increasing, the data can be very segregated, very distributed across multiple islands, multiple silos. So it's very important to have that view and have a monitoring software to understand where the data resides and uh, where, where it needs to be uh, protected. The second step, again, protect all data from all sources to have very robust, resilient approach uh, to protecting the data. Third is making um, the data uh, protection um, using a storage which is immutable and editable. So essentially, uh, you need to have almost think like a bunker, right? You have a bunker where the data is stored. Uh, nobody can, can enter that bunker. Nobody can change that data. Nobody can expire that image and completely air gap, which means there is no direct connect to that bunker. And that's what you need to really uh, come up with. Uh, the fourth step is um, the detect part of it, which is uh, trying to have a solution which is able to detect uh, through AI ML way. Um, there are some anomalous behaviors. And usually, as I said, uh, if there is a threat underway, it takes weeks and months uh, to get the attack. And uh, before that attack happens, uh, there are a lot of uh, pseudo attacks which give a good indication that there's something underway. So if you're able to detect that, you can actually prevent uh, the full-fledged attack uh, on the data center. So having uh, an engine which detects some of those signals um, uh, and anomalies can help significantly to do a preventive measure and preventing from a major attack. Uh, the fifth step is about optimizing uh, a rapid recovery. As I said, if, if the data center has been under attack, uh, either on the primary site or on the secondary site, um, how do you recover all the application uh, in a rapid and automated fashion? So that's that's absolutely a uh, very important step. And um, the sixth step is about uh, really rehearsal. So, uh, you know, you should not get surprises when the actual attack happens that, oops, my, um, the recovery is not working. So really uh, scheduled, um, you know, non-disruptive uh, recovery, um, uh, you know, rehearsals are very important for building uh, a strong cyber resilience. So uh, these are the six steps in which uh, we advise how we should design uh, the cyber resilience. Let me click on each of these steps a little bit more. As I said, the first step is really about uh, eliminating uh, the data that you have. And 30, you know, typical enterprises, 35% of the data is uh, lying dark, which it means um, nobody has, um, uh, nobody knows about it, uh, how it's being protected. Uh, there is no, you know, backup policy for that data. Um, nobody is regularly, you know, protecting that data. And, uh, and that's where we advise, it's very, very important to have a, a view of all the applications running in the data center to see if there are those dark pockets, if there are those applications or data repositories uh, which are not getting protected uh, and having an automated tool which discovers these applications and automated tool where it gives a report about what data is getting protected, what data is not getting protected is very important because large data centers very, it's almost impossible to manually figure out if something is, uh, is is fallen into that dark um, dark gap, right? So that's very important for any enterprise to be um, aware of uh, if there are those dark pockets uh, where the data is completely uh, not visible, not is not protected. So that's a very important first step that we advise uh, customers as part of building the cyber resilience. The second step is really about how do you 
protect the data uh, from all threat uh, sources. So think of it, where the source, where the threat would come from. One obviously is from the network. Um, so network perimeter is very important. Uh, but besides that, uh, when you talk about moving the data from uh, your backup or uh, the application server to the backup server, uh, the data has to be encrypted. So um, you know that's that's a very advisable strategy to ensure that data does not get tempered uh, on the way. So having having the data encrypted at rest and in transit is uh, another approach for building uh, the resiliency. Uh, zero trust architecture. You would have heard about this zero trust architecture. Essentially, uh, as you um, as as a threat comes up in the data center, it you know it moves east to west. Um, and north to south is typically through network, is to west is through lateral movement. So as application servers, if one application server gets infected, it could move into different application servers laterally. How do you prevent that? And that's where the zero trust architecture uh, should be followed. What does it mean? It, it means that um, none of the servers uh, you know, would give automatic access um, to the administrators or users. Each server, um, each application server need to do authentication, whether it's a multi-factor or SSO, uh, should be strictly followed. Uh, there should be a granular um, access control, right? Uh, Role-based access control. So that essentially what you do is for any application, uh, for any administrator in a very limited access. And that way what happens is even if an uh, application server gets infected, uh, the lateral movement of the malware is restricted. So. Uh, by zero trust, you're trying to really limit the, the the migration of the threat across the whole data center. And thirdly, uh, again, very important uh, part of the protect is uh, immutable storage. Whether you have on-premise or cloud, uh, there are options to do uh, uh, write-only one storage, worm storage. Uh, so that's that's a good strategy. Um, another important piece uh, which we have observed in in data. Uh, protection, uh, usually, uh, as I mentioned, a backup image has to be stored for 15 years. So their expiry will happen after 15 years. Many of the uh, bad actors here, they would change the system clock so that the backup application would expire all the images. And that's a very easy way of discarding the data rather than trying to delete the data. So uh, tempering of the clock has been one of the approaches used by the bad actors. And that's where, when you have a design, uh, when you look at the design uh, to protect your data, uh, a system clock or a compliance clock is very important, where the application does not rely on the system clock. It has its inbuilt compliance clock and ensures that all the system clocks is changed or tempered. The compliance clock always gives uh, uh, close to real time and uh, expiries of the data, premature expiries of the data are not, are not happening. Uh, and also another strategy for uh, immutable storage is um, hardened uh, purpose-built appliances because uh, as you build the solution, typically you'll have a hardware platform and operating system and other softwares, uh, are they hardened enough? Um, when you take a purpose-built appliances, uh, those are hardened, and that's kind of another way to build uh, a very robust and resilient uh, data repository uh, as part of your data protection strategy. So, again, very important uh, network security, very important. Make sure um, you know you evaluate data encryption at rest and at transit, um, zero trust architecture, so that there's a la no lateral movement of malware. Uh, that attack stays limited. And uh, from the immutable storage perspective, um, you have taken all the options, whether it's on-premise cloud, um, hard, uh, you know, uh, hardened purpose-built appliance, uh, which has um, a compliance clock. So those are um, the important pieces as when you think of designing um, uh, the protect strategy for, um, for your data. Now, if you look at typically uh, when you build um, a little bit of more on the how, how do you really build um, the immutable story. Uh, on the left, you'll see uh, your client applications. Uh, then you have backup applications in the middle. On the right, where you store uh, your data. So uh, typically, uh, the backup service will pick up the data from the client on the left and move the data 
uh, on to the right while storing some backup metadata. So uh, now look at the surface area, right? The whole um, hackers can attack the client uh, as long as they do not are not able to penetrate the backup applications or the storage, uh, you can recover from them. So your surface area in this case is going to be client, backup services, and immutable storage. So backup service itself has to be resilient, robust, so that it doesn't is not able to penetrate it, right? Um, the storage where the backup customer data resides as a backup images, it has to be air gapped. Uh, what does air gap means? There's no direct access. Nobody can really you know, connect to the storage uh, directly and uh, unless there are special privileges. So that allows, um, you know, uh, that prevents any uh, bad actor to access uh, the storage directly and temper the, uh, the images or the data. Now, what are the what are the different temperings possible? One is obviously somebody deleting the data, and if you have worm storage servers there, they will take they'll make sure that the data uh, does not get deleted. And the other risk I talked about was a compliance block. Somebody can expire that data, so the worm storage server has to rely on a compliance clock, which is independent of the system clock or the OS clock, and that will ensure that um, no matter what happens, that data is retained for whatever amount of time. Uh, that policy dictates. So if it's going to be 15 years, uh, the data will not expire for 15 years. That really ensures. So not able to delete the data, not able to expire data, completely isolated is a way you should really look at building a immutable um, a store for your data protection. So um, you'll see this, you know, um, uh, the surface area when you look at it, uh, the way you're doing is you're making your backup application very resilient and nobody can penetrate that. Um, also make sure uh, it has RBAC in place, uh, role-based access control in place uh, so that if a threat comes into a backup server, it cannot you know, move from there. Or if it's in the client, it can, cannot move from the backup services. And obviously build a very robust immutable store so that um, your malware does not have access because of the air gap into the immutable store. And if the data has to be restored, then there are special permissions and special privileges, which will allow uh, administrator to, to read that data and uh, recover uh, onto uh, the machine that he wants to. So that's on the, the step three part. Um, you know, there's one more piece which I want to highlight is about uh, credential management. And that's, I talked about our back control. So um, there are many customers who have their own credential management services like CyberArk or uh, Beyond Trust. So you need to really, the backup, uh, the data app, uh, protection application has to make sure it integrate with that uh, application. So ensure that um, you have a very robust um, a credential management system in place uh, to let uh, user access any of the um, data protection servers, services, or um, the, the data repositories. And that really credential management will complete control on who gets access to that. Uh, you know, multi-factor authentication, uh, also multiple users accessing, and you know, multiple users approving, authenticating access to the data also is very, very important. So those are the uh, strategies for the protect. Uh, let me get to the uh, step number four, and that's about a detect part of it. And this is where, you know, uh, as I said, there are there are ways uh, the security software on the client servers or even the backup servers uh, will be able to detect. But there's a very important piece uh, which a data protection application can fulfill, and that's about recognizing there are some anomalies happening. And usually, when ransomware attack happens, um, it it leaves some trails of um, the attack, and that usually is anomaly. Now, either it's a data change rate number of files, file extensions, file sizes. Uh, you, you know, so if you if you observe a healthy behavior, when the attack happens, there are the change of that behavior. And if by uh, uh, AI powered engine, if you are able to detect that, uh, then that's a, a very good, uh, you know, defensive mechanism. Uh, you can take preventive steps uh, to, to prevent a, a massive attack or prevent your backups from getting um, uh, you know, attack uh, by by the bad actors. So um, anomaly detection is going to be a very important part of 
the detect strategy. Uh, besides, you know, you have um, the security software which is trying to protect the data center. Uh, the other piece, which is what many customers are looking for now, is, hey, I've got uh, my server is attacked. I want to recover uh, the backup. Is that backup clean? So uh, malware scanning of the backup data are uh, is is completely uh, is ab absolutely must now. Every customer is wanting that uh, because I already got attacked. Now I'm trying to record the data. How do I know if that data is clean? And if it's not clean, I'm back to square one again. So um, customers really want to know. Uh, scan the data before it's recovered um, and uh, give give indication if it's a good copy. So uh, what is very important is knowing last known good copy and having uh, having a strategy where uh, on a regular basis uh, the backup images getting scanned uh, is, is very important. Uh, remember, um, scanning today does not mean the data is clean forever because uh, the scanning only scans for the signatures that are known today. If a signature was not known today, it will not scan for that signature. So if, if a zero day attack, if the virus does not have a signature, then you're gonna miss it. So scanning before recovery is an important strategy. Scanning regularly also is important strategy. Of course, um, if you have massive data, uh, to scan all that data regular basis is going to be cost. But you know that's a trade off, how often how important is the data, how often it should scan, I think can be decided by the policy. Uh, but having a ability to do on-demand scanning and the scanning at the recovery is absolutely must to be part of uh, building a resiliency in your um, data center. So that's a fourth strategy. You can look at uh, various mechanisms to um, you know, execute on this strategy. Uh, remember that it, it's not only about um, the data protection application detecting if if there's attack uh, there could be you know security software which are prevalent in the sec in a data center they also could detect something is going wrong so it's very good to have a database application which tunes in into this alerting mechanism like siem soar which give indication if um, if uh, a threat is underway right uh, so listening or tuning into those threats uh, or alerts is very, very important because that way you can prevent, um, uh, you can take preventive steps, um, you know, whether it's uh, stopping the expiration, um, isolating the, the backups or adding, maintaining multiple copies and, and so on and so forth, right? So essentially, uh, you know, it, it's not only you as an application detect, the backup application detect if something is wrong, something is anomaly, that's very, very important, but also listen in other sources who are detecting uh, uh, the threats and, and take action based on that. Also should contribute the alerts to the SIEM and kind of platforms where if if the database application, uh, uh, data protection application detects something is not right, is anomaly, it should report it into this platform so that the security monitoring software uh, and uh, security monitoring centers can take care of it, right? So it, it's going to be collaboration between uh, database data protection application and uh, the client uh, applications or the data centers uh, management software uh, to ensure that um, you know either of them picks up a threat indicator, uh, the response is immediately um, uh, given where you start protecting. Uh, the expiry of the backup data. So um, while designing, uh, need to have a good anomaly detection, have a good malware scanning, and also have integration with SIEM and SOAR so that you can exchange uh, the signals um, you know, either way and, and try to make sure the data is protected. So that's on, on the detect part. The fifth part is really uh, uh, is about um, the rapid recovery. So to, to uh, look at a simple uh, layout here where we have a primary site uh, where a bunch of you know services, storage, applications, uh, servers, uh, storage on the cloud as well as storage on premise, and there's a secondary site. So obviously there are a number of mechanisms to recover, bare metal recover. Uh, you know, many cases you will see even the hypervisor getting infected. So having a 
uh, having a bare metal uh, recovery is good because just recovering virtual machine may not be sufficient. Um, bulk recovery, cloud recovery, you know, uh, continuous data protection uh, rollback, all these are different recovery options. I think very, very important that your recovery, uh, you know, uh, process is automated and uh, this orchestration um, mechanism, uh, it usually because uh, you have hierarchy of applications and if uh, the, uh, when attack happens, you need to recover the whole data center back. Um, you try to piece all that uh, you know, uh, together, business service together is going to be very hard. So uh, you need to have an automated fashion where uh, the secondary site can be brought up using any of this recovery mechanism, whether it's a granular recovery or bulk recovery uh, is, is able to bring uh, in a sequence, same sequence, the application that, um, that you, you expect. Obviously bulk recovery is very important because multiple services getting infected, you need to support that. And um, uh, this, then you also look at cloud as another option to recover um, the application uh, data and, and the application service itself, right? So having a robust um, recovery, having um, uh, orchestrated automated recovery is going to be very important for, um, uh, for your uh, cyber resiliency, uh, for your um, you know, data, the application services. So um, another thing which you observe that um, at scale is very important. Remember that at the recovery time, if you have to scan every image, uh, that's going to be very time consuming. So uh, able to, you know, let's think of thousand virtual machines to be scanned and recovered. Um, it's, it's a mammoth task. So um, that needs to be planned. Uh, make sure the application is, recovery application is able to handle that kind of scale. Um, because that is going to decide your RTO, recovery time objective, right? Um, so uh, some of uh, businesses recovery time objective is very, very crucial. So based on that, you should really plan your uh, recovery or recovery process. Finally, last step is about rears. As I mentioned, um, how good is your resiliency unless you really test it, you would not know. So having, uh, having your... Um, you know, uh, having a sandbox where you can test uh, and see a non-intrusive way while the production machines are still on, uh, you can recover from your uh, secondary site or a backup machine and see if everything comes online, I think is very important. How frequently you do, do that depends on how critical is your application, but having a rehearsal mechanism, uh, which takes care of uh, the rehearsal in, um, in a isolated fashion, I think is, is very, very important. Uh, one more thing I would really mention about um, on the recovery part is isolated recovery is very important because uh, you do not want to have uh, a disruption to the, to the production server. So uh, six step rehearsal, very, very important to have um, a robust and reliable uh, recovery uh, for your application. Um, I'm on the last slide here, automated recovery uh, for last one. So if you look at uh, how the things will flow, right? You're trying to protect the data um, and the, uh, the appliances could be there. You can have hardware, cloud, tape, wherever you put your backup data, right? Um, and the isolated recovery is trying to really make sure that you have instant access to the data. You do the scanning, uh, which are options you use for recovery, granular file recovery or bare recovery, uh, bulk recovery, instant or cloud recovery. Um, it, it should be isolated because as I said, uh, if the data is infected, uh, then you do not want to uh, proliferate into um, any other services. So having isolation is very important and that's where you re recover your data back. So uh, that's in sum um, uh, the, the strategy to um, use really data protection uh, as a key uh, for building a cyber resiliency against uh, ransomware attacks. Um, with that, let me um, uh, sum up here. Uh, thanks for uh, joining this session. Um, I wanted to really share, uh, it's on everybody's mind, uh, the ransomware threat. Uh, every enterprise is, at, uh, is worrying about it. Every customer that we talk to, uh, there are only two topics, cloud and ransomware threat. And how do you really protect against that? So having this six step approach, uh, protect, detect, recover uh, uh, proposed by NIST, I think that's very, very relevant, very, very appropriate. And if you're able to build this, um, 
how you can really build cyber resilience against ransomware threats. That let me um, uh, thank all of you and end this session and we can open up for Q&A. Thank you.